So I've been working my way through a, a series of 12 books, reading um, this, what's called the Voice of Witness series. The Voice of Witness um, are oral histories um, from around the world that illuminate human, right crisis, human rights crises. The books are set, some of them are set in the United States or around the world in places like Sudan, Myanmar, and Palestine. Most recently, I read a book in that series set in Zimbabwe. The book contains 16 oral histories from people who've survived political repression or economic devastation or the refugee crisis within and beyond the borders of Zimbabwe. One oral history in particular stuck with me. This testimony was given by a passionate and charismatic man named Sanko Chari, who had worked as an organizer for the political party in Zimbabwe, opposing the corruption and violence of the Mugabe regime there. As a result of his political activity, Chari suffered multiple times from imprisonment and torture. And after a harrowing abduction in which he was kidnapped, placed in a coffin, and driven up into the mountains where he was threatened with death, Chari fled the country and went to South Africa where he received treatment at the Southern Africa Center for Torture Survivors. One day a call comes to him from Zimbabwe, and the caller, not knowing who is picking up the phone, shares with him the news that Sankochari has died. Imagine that, picking up the phone and hearing a message that you've died. He laughs and thinks it's some kind of joke, but then later on he calls back and he finds out that his best friend and his brother um, were killed by the Zimbabwean secret police, but they believed they had killed him, but it was actually his brother and his best friend. Chari concludes this oral history by saying this. He says, someone killed Gabriel and my own brother. That's why I often just feel like a dead person. If only I could be reintegrated again and go back and fight for the cause because it's unfinished work. If you go to the Bible, there's a guy who dug a well. He started taking out water and drinking the water, but other people came and said, this is our well. And the guy said, okay, I'm leaving. He went on to dig another well and started drinking water again. I hope that soon I'm going to find another way. I'm going to try and dig another well to drink water. But right now, I'm just surviving. The police in Zimbabwe were saying, Chari has died. Chari has died. It's only now that they know that Sanko Chari is still alive. And the book of oral histories ends on this defiant note. Sanko Chari is still alive. Despite the lives lost, despite the destruction wrought, despite the lives uprooted, despite the communities torn apart, despite the nation deteriorating, despite it all, this note of resistance, even in the face of so much. Sanko Chari is still alive. This affirmation says something to me about the nature of resurrection. Maybe I'm taking too many liberties in interpretation, but Sanko Chari's story reminds me of Jesus' story. After all, Chari was opposing the corruption and brutality and illegitimacy of the Mugabe government on behalf of the poor and the suffering, just as Jesus opposed the corruption and brutality and illegitimacy of the Roman occupation on behalf of the poor and the suffering. Chari was imprisoned, <coughs> tortured, and rose from his coffin, literally. Jesus was imprisoned, tortured, and the story tells us that he rose from the grave. I know that analogies compare things more dissimilar than similar, but still. So let me make a deal with all of you. I hope that none of you will leave here this morning and go out and when asked what was the Easter sermon about, you'll explain, well, our minister explained to us that the story of the resurrection was really just a case of mistaken identity. Let's be clear, that's not my message. I suppose and I know that there are all sorts of ways to make sense of the resurrection story. Some people 
maybe as many as a billion people, believe that the Gospels provide an accurate historical and factual accounting of Jesus' death and resurrection. Other people say the exact opposite, that the story was fabricated, that Jesus never actually lived, that there was no crucifixion or burial or resurrection. Others try to make sense of the story by speculating that something must have happened to Jesus' body, and that's, that's why the tomb was found empty. Or they talk about how when the disciples reassembled, their love for one another and their love for Jesus was so powerful that they felt and experienced Jesus' presence around them. I have to tell you that actually I am not all that interested in speculating about the historical accuracies or inaccuracies of the passion stories. It doesn't matter to me one bit whether the resurrection is a historical truth or a hoax or a trick or a conspiracy or a metaphor. All that really matters to me is that in the aftermath of death, destruction, and despair, people came together and in the presence of one another decided to turn towards life again. William Sloan Coffin, the great American liberation theologian, liberal theologian, said that you can read the Bible to find certainties, but it is better to read the Bible to find sympathies, to look not for historical truth, but for deep human understanding. My colleague Daniel Budd writes about these sympathies. He joked that many years ago, the UU church he was serving received an invitation from the local newspaper to place an ad for Easter Sunday, and that someone in the church suggested placing an ad that said something like, join us. We're not really sure what happened. <laughs> but he then goes on to say that while we're not sure what happened, we do know. We do know what it feels like when someone appears whose message offers hope. And we do know what it feels like when someone grows profoundly into our lives. And we do know what it feels like to lose someone we love and to feel that sorrow loss, despair, and grief. And we know what it's like to realize, to have it dawn upon us, that what we have known and loved lives on now with and within us, becomes a part of who we are. We know that somehow in our hearts and souls, resurrection is real, not that of the body, but of the spirit, a spirit renewed, even reborn, in the midst of our lives and our living. Resurrection, I believe, isn't about what happened over there long ago at some moment in distant history. And resurrection, I believe, isn't about what happened apart from us, an event that took place in some remote location. No, it is about what is happening within us when we turn towards life again. And it's about what happens among us when we turn towards life again. Resurrection doesn't happen passively. It's something that requires our own active participation. It's something that requires our own active participation. The Catholic mystic poet Dorothy Soul writes of the role that we're expected to play in resurrection. She has this beautiful poem called Not Without You. It goes like this. He needs you. That's all there is to it. Without you, he's left hanging, goes up in Dachau's smoke, is sugar and spice in the baker's hands, gets revalued in the next stock market crash. He's consumed and blown away, used up without you. Help him. That's what faith is. He can't bring it about, his kingdom. Couldn't then, couldn't later, can't now. Not at any rate without you. And that is his irresistible appeal. And so there is resurrection that we participate in as a church community. As we worship together this morning, Marion and our high school youth are on their way back from New Orleans, where they spent a week doing community service, helping to rebuild and resurrect the city of New Orleans a decade after Hurricane Katrina. Life again. Here in our local community, our members are preparing to build our 20th Habitat for Humanity home. 
life again. And through Justice United, our members are participating in campaigns to protect tenant rights and develop affordable housing right here in our own backyard. Life again. For the past several weeks, I've been meeting with a small group of church members who constitute the preaching practicum class. This group of members are going to take turns preaching and leading worship in June and July. And on those Sundays, they'll share their own powerful stories of transformation, transformed through the power of listening, through kindness, through their own life story of moving from pain to wholeness. I've gotten the earliest drafts of some of their stories, their stories of life again. So resurrection, I believe, isn't about what happened over there long ago at some moment in distant history. And resurrection, I believe, isn't about what happened apart from us, an event that took place in some remote location. No, it is about what is happening within us when we turn towards life again. It's about what happens among us when we turn towards life again. It doesn't happen passively, but it is something that requires active participation. I leave you this morning with words by Frederick Buchner. He counseled, the worst isn't the last thing about the world. It's the next to last thing. The last thing is the best. It's the power from on high that comes down into the world that wells up from the rock bottom worst of the world like a hidden spring. Can you believe it? The last best thing is the laughing deep in the hearts of the saints, sometimes in our hearts even. Yes, you are terribly loved and forgiven. Yes, you are healed and all is well. As you go, go with the knowledge that the last thing is not the reign of empire. The last thing is not the victory of death. The last thing is the first thing again. It is life again. And I wish a joyful Easter to each and every one of you.